your recording. Welcome to week 11, day two. Your uh, next midterm will be next Thursday. We'll review it next Tuesday. Basically all the topics we've talked about so far. A lot of multiple choice questions on branch prediction, um, out of order execution, speculative execution, superscalar computing, SIMD, assembly, everything we've talked about is fair game. During spring break? Nah, the actual next week of school. Well, one after spring break. So, uh, over spring break, you have your syscall assignment, right? I know some of you guys wanted another one, but I think uh, you ended up getting two weeks for the syscall assignment. So, we'll I think that was Alan wanted uh, to give you guys two days for the syscall assignment. Uh, you guys have any questions about the syscall assignment? See, Debello is actually working on it. Good man, good man. Uh, all right, so let's let's talk about syscalls first, and we got some architecture stuff to talk about. So, mm, some other things we need to talk about too. But yeah, syscalls are good. Okay, so. Uh, I mentioned this briefly before, but now you got to do the homework to do it, so you know you actually have to know it. So, register 7 is a normal register that gets preserved and all that other stuff, but it has a special purpose. Special purpose is to select which syscall you're doing. Because even though it looks like you should be able to do software interrupt 5 or software interrupt 7 or software interrupt 40, nope it's always software interrupt zero. Software interrupt zero means invoke the Linux kernel, basically. And so what the Linux kernel does is it takes over at this point. When, when this execution runs, it pages your uh, program out of memory, pages the Linux kernel in, <clears throat> starts running the Linux kernel. Linux kernel has something called an interrupt handler. An interrupt handler is a very, very fast uh, chunk of code that basically will look at register seven <clears throat> and say, oh, you want a system call four, and then it executes whichever function pointer it has in register four, or a uh, table entry four, let's say. System call four is right. So right gets invoked and it will read from the normal, you know, function parameters, R0, R1, R2, R3. It reads them and uh, goes, okay, this is what you want to write. You're going to write to the standard output, this starting at this memory address here, this many bytes, and it will do it. It'll just read through memory. However, it will not read through memory you don't have permission for. So it does do some vetting of permissions to make sure that you have permissions on the file descriptor on the chunk of memory you're trying to read um, through the end of the chunk of the memory you're trying to read or write to. <clears throat> and if everything goes right, then what it does, it goes one byte at a time and copies them into that file. And uh, everything in Unix is basically a file, and so you just write to the file. And, uh, and that file, quote unquote file, might be a network socket. And so data goes out over the Ethernet card. Or it might be an actual file, or it might be the terminal. And so when you write characters to the terminal, the, the the way the teletype device is set up is that anytime you write to it, it will print the characters on your screen. And so the write system call actually doesn't really care too much, right? I'm just going to write to this file. And then the file will handle it differently. Okay, that makes sense. So... Here is some, uh, yeah, I got descriptions of how everything works. If you want to know the number of a system call, I've got a hyperlink here. It's probably pretty useful. Uh, this is for x86. It's not for ARM. But as far as I can tell, really, okay. Uh, really, really, really. All right, forgot about that. Kernel Grok, uh, Kernel Grok uh, system. All right, forget about that that thing. Jeez. All right. Um, 
syscalls.kernelrock.com is compromised, it looks like. Yeah, it's unfortunate. This one. Here we go. There. Right. Uh, nope, these are all the wrong numbers. Damn. Try this one. It's the worst thing about it. this one doesn't work either. Yeah, the, the one of the worst things about the system calls is that there's not actually good documentation for it. Um let's see. <laughs> All right. This is this is sixty four bit though. This is the wrong order. <sighs> Great, fantastic. Well, I'll, I'll find a I'll find a reference for you. Nope. <laughs> I'll find a reference for you. But basically, um, yeah. Even Bruce Smith is like, I can't find like a a good website that has a list of uh, all of the system calls for you know the arm uh, 32 version of linux i assume they're the same as the x86 version but who knows so uh yeah so there are these uh <laughs> bro <laughs> there are these um, uh tables that and the tables basically list system call one is this system call two is this system call three is this and uh, and so what you do to select a system call is you choose it from register seven. One, two, right. And so usually um, the section two of the man pages is system calls. And so it doesn't give you the number of the system call, but usually the uh, parameters are exactly as it matches. Yep. So let's go through this source code here. Nope. <laughs> Just nope. Sorry. No references for you. If any of you guys sitting at home want to find a better table. How uh, do you know which this call is which number? Delete. <laughs> you can't. All right. Let's go with that for now. Uh, <laughs> so uh, system call one is exit. So if you put one into, into register seven, and then invoke the kernel. The kernel's like, oh, he's calling exit and we'll quit the program. Okay. Uh, so calls three and four are read and write. Uh, fork is system call two. We talked about fork last time. It will duplicate your program. <clears throat> if you wanna crash a server, do an infinite loop on system call two. It's pretty easy. It's called a fork bomb. Uh, There is a, a, a Unix shell script about that big that fork bombs the server. You can try looking it up and run it on your own machine, not on mine. I'll be upset if you run it on mine. It eats up all the CPU time. So I do not have quotas installed. I used to. I used to have quotas installed. And um, turns out that uh, telling a student they can't use the CPU for the rest of the semester is kind of rough. It will stop a runaway process, I guess, but then I have to go in and reset the, the thing. All right, uh, so yeah, so this code here is gonna say, what is your age? It's gonna read in two digits. It's gonna output your age plus 10. All right, so let's go through this. So this is code that does not, okay, this is using main. So we're gonna compile this using GCC. But I could I could probably do this without any reference to the uh, yeah I don't I don't have any I don't have any need for the standard library at all so I could, I could rewrite this as underscore start and it would work just fine <clears throat> I would just have to compile it with ass rather than GCC all right so what is happening here so we are going to call the write system call the write system call as I just showed you guys takes Three parameters, it takes a file descriptor. Do you guys remember which file descriptors are which? You always get three for free. Do you guys remember what those are? Ever since CSI 40?
I talked about it last time. <clears throat> okay. So file descriptor is zero is standard output. Standard input. File descriptor one is standard output. File descriptor two is standard error. Okay. Zero is standard input. One is standard output. Two is standard error. What is file descriptor three? There isn't one. <laughs> Trick question. Yeah. All right. So um, if you want to write to the standard output, that's file descriptor one. Okay. So you put a one here. You pass in the memory address of a string that you want to print. And you pass in the size of the string. Greeting is the name of string. I'm going to go get my second shot today for coronavirus, and they were already out of vaccines, unfortunately. Oh. So this is a null terminated string. You guys remember how strings work in SeaWorld. It is a bunch of characters with a null at the end of it, an invisible null if you don't see. And so that's what ASCII Z means. If I did this, it would not be null terminated, and the thing, you know, well, we've got the length here, so it would actually be fine. Uh, literally went today at the Big Fresno Fair. Did you get your shot, Malia? Which, uh, which one was it? Is it Pfizer or Moderna? Pfizer. Okay. Yeah, let me know how you feel. Right. Uh, what is your age? Okay, so this is a string, right? And this here is a thing. <clears throat> it's a little bit of uh, assembly magic. And what this is, is it's saying, take my memory address and subtract the memory address of greeting. And so what that's going to do, it's going to compute the length of the string for you. So if you were to make it longer, Greeting length would get longer as well. It's a cool little trick that I discovered on how to do string lengths in assembly. All right, so <clears throat> you could sit there and count it, you know, if you wanted one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Um, or you could use this trick here. Like I think for this one, I didn't, I didn't use the trick. So we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 12, 13, 14 characters, maybe 15. I counted pretty quickly. Nope, 14. Good. <clears throat> so right there, it, this is how you want to print a string. Okay. So for this assignment, you cannot use printf. You cannot use cout. For this assignment, you must use nothing but assembly and system calls. This is the lowest level of programming you'll need to do. And so if we want to print the string here, your age plus 10, come up here and you can see it loads the address, LDR with an equal sign, loads the address of output. Okay. <clears throat> so that loads the memory address of output, which is to say the memory address of the first letter in the string. That goes into R1. R0, the first parameter is which file to write to. We're going to be writing to standard output. Standard output is one. So first parameter is going to be one standard output. Second parameter is the address of output, the output string. <clears throat> and then the third parameter is going to be 14, which is the number of bytes to write. R0, R1, R2. And then we have to select register seven, four, which means call the write system call and we invoke software interrupt zero. And that, my friends, is how you print a string without needing printf, without needing C, C out, <clears throat> or C error, or any of that stuff. What do you guys think? Easy? Google? Yep. You got um, 
sample source code. So <clears throat> you should be able to do it for the assignment. See how it's a little bit easier. Not an assembly, because see how it has like some garbage long name, right? After a software interrupt, the program exits or it resumes? Great question. <clears throat> so what happens when you do SWE zero? When you do SWE zero, uh, it swaps your program out of memory, it swaps the kernel into memory, and uh, the kernel has what's called an interrupt handler, that that's where it goes to every time you do a SWE zero. It jumps to the fourth entry, or entry number four, I should say, it's the fifth entry technically, into the uh, the jump table, the list of all the the handlers for open and read and write and fork and exec and all those things. And then all those things are just a memory address and that memory address is what's called a function pointer. So it just sets the program counter to be whatever value is in memory there, <clears throat> which is a memory address of where the code is. It jumps there, it runs the code corresponding to write, which does a lot of things, uh, checking permissions and stuff like that. And then when write returns, it's an interrupt. So it goes right back where it was before. So when you have an interrupt, it pauses your program, runs the interrupt handler, and then it comes right back where it was before. And so after it does that, then it just moves right on to the next chunk of code. So if we were to GCC program 18 and run it, what is your age? Um, 21, age plus 10 is 31. Okay. 42, age plus 10 is 50. So, uh, do, 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 do. how did I do that magic? Well, <clears throat> here's the whole program. First things first, I printed the string. Please enter your age. It's the same code that we just covered a second ago. We're writing to standard output. We load the memory address of, we load the memory address of the, um, we load the memory address of the string we're going to print. And then you can either print 29 characters into it, or you can use that one cool trick that doctors hate <coughs> to calculate the length of a string for you. But you have to use LDR for it, because anytime you grab something out of the data segment, you can use LDR, basically. And... Is that right? And uh, <clears throat> and then we pass in to register seven that we want to do right, and we invoke SWE zero. Then we're going to read from the keyboard. Reading from the keyboard works almost the same way. You pass in standard input as the file descriptor. You pass in a memory segment you're going to read into. Uh, how do you make an array? How do you make an array in assembly? Well, uh, here I just made a big empty string. And so hopefully they don't type more than a few characters, right? It, in fact, the read, the read function I give says read a maximum of two characters. So this is fine. This is actually overkill. Another way you can do it is by saying uh, input uh, skip 400 or something like that. And that will make an array of size 400 bytes. That's a different way you can do it. <clears throat> okay, so uh, do, 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 do. I made it an empty string though, in case they only if they type only one letter. See, see what the problem is. <clears throat> it reads in a one and a new line. It reads in a one and a new line, then it prints out two and a new line. <laughs> This code is not what we call robust code. Yeah, so this this here is a, is a neat little trick you can use that will compute the size of a string. It gets your memory address, subtracts the memory address of greeting, the memory address of greeting, the memory address of W, subtracts them out, and then that's a number of bytes. So it's, a, it's an easy way to do string length without having to sit there and count it. I remember once on a final, <clears throat> I had the students print, um, what was it?
describe the uh, Doctor of Thugonomics uh, paragraph and have them print that. It's had a lot of people on the final scene are going like. <laughs> Counts the null character too, yeah. Mm -hmm. Although it's not, <clears throat> it actually doesn't matter in, in this case whether or not it's um, null terminated because the thing will only write a number of characters equal to the um, the number of bytes you give it. So <clears throat> if I made this an ASCII, so I'm going to ask Z. It still works. Because it, the write has a maximum number of bytes that it writes. And so it just doesn't get to the, the null character. But I always feel more confident with the null character. Okay, so uh, we are going to read into that chunk of memory that we have. So do you guys understand like how this works? Like an assembly, we're in the data segment. So the data segment just is a different chunk of memory. There's nothing really special about it. Technically you could probably, probably work. A oh, seg fault. <laughs> Maybe not. So, uh, this the data segment is just the place where you make your variables really and uh, <clears throat> and so uh, i have a variable named input and it's of type ascii z and it is that string there it's an old terminated string of length i don't know 20 or 30 or something I don't know. Uh, you can also make variables other ways you can make uh, integer x of type word initialized to to, uh, you, you make you make variables and and then you can load and store to them that's that's one of the ways of getting around the uh register limit right once once you kind of run out of registers then you have to start reading and writing to spots in memory so, does data have to be at the bottom no uh anytime the compiler um gets a dot data directive that will skip over to the data uh, segment and it handles all the alignment issues. Remember how we were talking about that? Like things have to be on like four byte boundaries and, and things like that. It, it handles that for you, which is nice. Okay. So uh, by default, I think you can say like a text, text, something like that. So let's see here. Um, G plus plus dash S GCC dash S PWM demo dot C then PWM demo dot S. <clears throat> so if you look at the assembly generated by the GNU compiler suite, uh, you can see that there's actually a lot of um, there's a lot of directives that it gives the assembler. We're using the ARMv6 assembly language here. We don't need anything more than that. Uh, it sets some extended ABI attributes so it knows what kinds of things you have. <coughs> it saves the name of the file that we came from so that if you are using a debugger, it'll be like, this is from file pwmdemo.c, line 50, whatever. Text segment, this is the code segment, right? So that it defaults to the text segment, but they put it in there anyway, because why not? And then section read only data aligned to uh, two byte boundaries, or is that four? It's two to the four byte boundaries yeah it, <clears throat> the align directive actually takes powers of two so you can align zero align one or align two align zero aligns to one byte boundaries align one aligns to two byte boundaries and align two aligns to four byte boundaries <clears throat> here we have an ascii no z right why no z because they put the null character here you guys see that so they could have done it like that same thing and then uh, so we went to the text section then we went to the read-only data section aligned to a four byte boundary created a string called setup wiring pi failed go back into the text section to, so to answer your question uh, Trangio see how you can just like kind of hop back and forth and that's because compilers can just kind of like as they go along they can just like do stuff you know <clears throat> this text section doesn't really do very much 
Uh, so text, again, aligned to four byte boundaries, global main, architecture arm v6 again, unified syntax, arm, we've got a vector float processor for the FPU, or Fresno Pacific University, of course. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> this is a function, uh, so it's giving a, a type to uh, main the label. How many args are we taking? What's the frame size? In other words, how many variables we have um, here? Uh, push just the frame pointer in the link register. Add four to the frame pointer. Subtract eight from the stack pointer. Uh, stack pointer moves down, frame pointer moves up. <clears throat> Branch of link to wiring pi setup. Capture the return value of wiring pi setup, put it into register three. Uh, compare not register three with one branch not equal to dot l2 otherwise we're going to load l10 into r0 call printf put one into r3 branch l9 and so you know you guys all did that uh reverse engineering thing you can you know it's good it's good <clears throat> it's good practice you can go through and kind of figure out what's going on here and then this is it this is the entire program it's actually not very big it's only 92 lines of code, and that's with all the extra stuff in here that, to be frank, we could delete all this, you know, most of it. So, um, so we could actually make this quite short. Uh, see here, size, size main, dot minus main. <clears throat> so this gets the size of uh, the main function. So from here to main, Right, so this is <coughs> uh, computing how big the main the main function is. Uh, identity GCC da 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 section note GNU stack da 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 word word. Uh, <coughs> so so to answer your question, yeah, you can uh, you can hop back and forth at will. All right, so uh, come back in here. So print the output. Let's see, how do we center output, center output, center output. So like to do an a inline. I have a variable called inline because this is not C++. We do not have inline, right? So when you uh, standard out inline two letters, call right, it just prints the new line here. That's not actually what inline does, by the way. Inline in C++ both prints a new line <clears throat> and it flushes the memory. So. You like the Z better? Yeah, me too. And same thing. Kind of no point to it though. All right, so load, okay, so. So we read from the keyboard into the input array and <clears throat> we tell it uh, read at most three characters because there's two characters plus the new line to read, right? So the new line is a character. And so if they type in 42 return, it's going to be 42 and new line are the three characters read. Uh, read is system called three. We sweet zero it. And then when we when this returns, this array down here, this array down here is going to have 42 new line in it. Okay. So <clears throat> if we want to add one to the first digit, add 10 to the first digit, uh, we load the memory address of input into our zero. We load the first byte. Uh, again, you, you don't need the hashtag zero there. We load the first byte from it into our one. We add one to it, so 42 becomes 52. And then we store it back into the same memory address. And then um, <clears throat> we print it. So we, uh, here. we load the memory address of input again. We're going to print two letters, 52 in this case, call write, and then 42 becomes 52. That's it. It's not too bad, I don't think. It's kind of annoying. Like I prefer printf, but it's it's doable. 
Um, it's kind of important to know syscalls, just because that is like the um, that is like the <clears throat> list of everything you can actually do. Right. The C standard library, the C++ standard library, they can't do anything, right? All they are is just a layer on top of the uh, the system calls, right? So. <laughs> well, not very useful. Slightly more useful. Okay, so here is, <clears throat> with no description whatsoever, a list of all the system calls in x86 Linux, okay? This list here is the list of everything you can do, period. Because the operating system sits between your program and the hardware. Without the operating system's permission, your program can do nothing. So if you want to try printing to the screen, it cannot print to the screen unless the operating system gives it permission to print to the screen. And so it's important to know what's in the system call list because that's what you can do with a computer. <laughs> or at least that operating system on a computer. Right? <clears throat> you can make a directory in a program. Yeah, you can. So, um, right there. Nictor. So you can make a directory, you can remove a directory. Dupe we talked about last time allows you to move file descriptors around. Um, or duplicate, it basically duplicates a file descriptor, but it's mostly used in conjunction with things like pipes and things like that. I've actually got a cool story about it. <coughs> I don't know why my voice still hasn't come back. It's been two, almost two full weeks now. Um, the bioengineering department at UCSD hired me to rewrite <clears throat> a bunch of Fortran programs and C programs from like ancient times, like the 1970s, into Java and put them online, make a web 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 based access for it. Okay. There's one one small twist, <clears throat> which is that I don't know Fortran. Right? I might have uh, studied it for about a week in my programming languages class, maybe, but uh, maybe not even then. Maybe we just learned about it. I don't think I actually wrote a program in Fortran ever. Um, <clears throat> a lot of the high-performance code that I worked with in Fortran, I would work with. I didn't edit it. I didn't read it, but I knew it worked. Uh, Fortran has the same function calling standard as C. So if you wanted to call a Fortran function from C++, what would you do? If you had a C++ program and there's a function program, a uh, Fortran program called foo, how would you call that from C++? What, what do you guys think? Yeah. Dupe the system calls? No. <clears throat> you don't have to, we're, we're not at the system call level yet. If you want to have C++ call a Fortran function, the Fortran function could be compiled into a .o file. It doesn't really matter. How do you, uh, how do you, how do you call it? Link it, include it. Yeah, because remember C++ has to know about a function before it can call it. So how do you include in a header file a function from Fortran? Hashtag define what? Give me a, give me a line of code. The Fortran uh, the Fortran function is called foo. Doesn't take any parameters. Doesn't return any parameters. All it does is print hello world. <clears throat> How do you invoke that from C plus plus? Hashtag foo. Good guess. No. Extern C. You guys remember that? So I'd say extern C void foo that. I toss that into a header file or the top of my .cc file, doesn't really matter. And now C++ can call foo. 
and Fortran. That's it. Fortran uses C's name bindings. It uses the same name bindings that assembly does. So that's it. That's all you have to do. You throw that in there, you have your C++ code down in main. Later on in main, you just call foo, like that. And normally that would be a linker error, right? But in your make file, you take your C++.o, you take the Fortran.o, and go, and then it works. That's it. So if you want your C++ code to call Fortran code, just extra and C, give it the function name from Fortran, and that's it. Easy. So I figured that out. And uh, so they hired me for a two-year project, right? To <clears throat> take this Fortran code and uh, make it a web app, basically. So in other words, not just going from like Fortran to C, but like jumping ahead, you know, three generations of uh, technology, <laughs> you know? <clears throat> this, this is a program that existed prior to the internet existing, right? Like back then ARPANET existed, but it wasn't really on the radar of people making heart cell simulations that there would be a need for people over the interwebs to run their heart cell simulation and do experiments over the internet like you know <laughs> they would give the source code to people compile it and run it yourself you know so that's it and that's what they did that's how that's how the bioengineering department did it was every time they bought a new machine They would take their source code for Lua Rudy and all these other uh, heart cell models, and they would have to port it to the new Unix system they just bought. And every time you port it, something breaks. And they hired me to do that in part it was I was porting things to their their new systems and 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 things like how timers worked would change and size of integers would change and all this kind of stuff that would break in all sorts of interesting and different ways and. <clears throat> You know, porting from Linux to Solaris and, you know, things break. And so, you know, they hired me in part to do that, too. Um, and so they had uh, Andrew McCulloch, who's a very brilliant professor at UC San Diego. He had the he had the very brilliant idea. And I'm, I'm not using that sarcastically at all. He's a really smart dude, a really awesome dude, too. I like him a lot. Um, when we went to Stanford, uh, we, had, we saw a presentation from this guy who was talking about this, like, heart modeling thing. And I'm like... Have you ever met Andrew McCulloch? Because he does a lot of the heart, you know, modeling stuff. He's like, oh yeah, I was his grad student. <laughs> I was his grad student at UCSC. Cool dude. I'm like, yeah, he's a cool. Dude. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so he hired me to take all the. So rather than having to go through this rigmarole of updating, you know, ancient code from the ancient days to every new system that comes out, <clears throat> put make a make a web app. Right, like basically, make it so that somebody could go to the website and the cell model appears there. You can edit the parameters. We're going to change the intracellular calcium level by twenty percent, and you hit simulate, and then it runs the numerical calculations, and then it spits out graph, 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 graph of like, you know, the intracellular potassium and calcium and sodium over time, and the voltage and all these other things. It's like forty different parameters, and it generates all these different graphs over time. And then you don't have to keep porting it and, and, and like maybe one guy ports it and then he shares it with his friends, they share it. So it's like this underground network of like bioengineering professors like sharing updates to the code with each other and it's very ad hoc. And so, uh, <clears throat> and so uh, he hired me to do this. And, and I was just sitting there looking at this Fortran program like, I have no idea what's going on here. <laughs> like this, <laughs> Yeah, right. Uh, let's see. Can we find the source code? Yeah, that's what I want. It's not Fortran. Uh, 1991. Whatever. Wouldn't mean anything to you guys either, I think, unless you've done Fortran before. Anyway, point is, 
The point is, is that this program was reading from the standard input and writing to the standard output. And I was like, yeah, it'd be really cool if I could like write a C++ program. It was like a web server kind of thing and it would take a request in and then it would type on the keyboard of the Fortran program, the input. And then when the Fortran program spit out the, the data, it would read that and then send it over to the, the client. So my original first take on it <coughs> was to do a Unix file redirection, right? So call system, you guys remember system, it runs a Unix line. And so I would read from the person on the internet, the input file, write it to a file, then cat it, pipe into the Fortran program, right arrow, redirecting the output of it into a file, and then take that file and send it over the interwebs back to the client who would then visualize it. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? Am, am I speaking Greek? It's like, I say cat print hello, that dumps, that dumps the, uh, the file to the screen, right? Remember how we talked about last time you do a pipe. So let's say I've got the Fortran program here. I'm just gonna call it Fortran later. And so what this would do is the Fortran program, rather than reading from the keyboard like I thought it was, it would be reading from the result of cat, right? <clears throat> like that. And then, uh, like that, right? And then, but rather than the output going to the screen, I would redirect the output to a, a file. And you can do that using right arrow. File 2112. And then if you then file 2112, you can see the output of the program now. And so this takes the standard output of a program and changes it from being to the screen to a file on disk. And so that was my original brilliant first take on the problem was that I didn't want to mess with Fortran at all. In fact, I'm, I'm, I've been very happy all of my days not knowing Fortran. A lot of people like Fortran. Um, yeah, uh, the idea that you have to space indent a program like doesn't appeal to me. Five spaces, no more, no less. Five shall be the number of the counting. It's because Fortran is made on punch cards. Right, so the language itself matches punch cards. That's how old the damn thing is. So, <clears throat> so do you guys understand this? This was my first take on the issue. So I'd, I would write a program that would be a web server, basically. It would talk to a client that I would write. The client would ship over the configuration data, all your intracellular potassium, da 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 da, into a file. I would cat that file into the into the Fortran program. And then I'd save the results of the Fortran program into a file. And then my web server would wait for the Fortran program to finish and, and then ship it back over. You guys understand? And then I don't have to change the Fortran. I don't have to read the Fortran. I don't have to understand it. I don't have to go line by line through 9 trillion lines of code and recreate them in Java or whatever. Hell no. I can just leave it all the same. We don't touch the ancient code. We just leave it, right? <clears throat> So um, that was my brilliant first take. Then I was in a Unix class and actually not a Unix class. Uh, this was after I'd taken Unix, but the Unix class didn't actually talk about Unix system calls. It was all shell scripting. Um, I was in uh, Bennett Yee's class. I took two with him. One of them was cryptography, which is awesome. And the other was, um, it was like, I don't remember exactly what it was, but it was like the name of the class, but it was like Linux internals. Like how does, how does an operating system work on the inside? And we went through all the system calls and we went over a system call called dupe. Like literally when I was working on this problem and I was like, ah, that lecture that I gave you guys last time, that was a lecture that Benny E gave me. I don't know how many years ago, <clears throat> right when I was studying that's in. Right when I was studying uh, his class, I had a problem that needed it. And so that's the power of knowledge, right? So uh, Bennett E, really? 
LinkedIn, I've got to log in. What is this nonsense? Your login attempt seems suspicious. Really? I just want to look at Bennett's profile, dude. Come on. Seriously. Yeah, Bennett, Bennett's a cool dude. Um, I actually knew about him before I even went to UC San Diego uh, because uh, he was in a book of the internet. So back in the day, the internet was so small, there was actually a book that had all the web pages of the world in it. And so, so I had a book that had the entire internet in it, basically. And so there was this um, uh, cool thing that was like a internet enabled Coke machine. And so you could log into the Coke machine and it would tell you how many uh, cans of Coke, how many cans of Diet Coke, how many cans of Mountain Dew or whatever, uh, probably not in a Coke machine, but whatever, uh, were in the machine, right? And uh, and so, uh, Bennett, you did it. And uh, and so I, when I took his class, I'm like, you're the guy that did the, the internet Coke machine. He's like, yeah, I was weirdly famous for that. Yeah, it was just like this fun little project I did. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, I don't know why that blew up, but you know, it, was, it was pretty cool. So Bennett was, uh, uh, please do not contact, connect with me. I don't even like link my best friends here. <laughs> Um, so he worked at Google for a number of years, uh, as a professor at UCSD when I was there. Yeah. And so he left, he left UCSD to join Google. And while he was at Google, he, uh, helped build, um, Chrome, the Chrome OS. Stuff like that. So, um, really cool dude. And so he knew operating systems. The, um, class that I took taught me about dupe and then i was like oh damn all those things we just learned with like dupe and fork and exec i can solve this entire two-year project in like a couple months now why how what i did was basically this vim uh whatever dot cc i did this i said uh close file descriptor zero uh then it's the Uni STD, yeah. Let me show you what I did. Close. Which is file descriptor zero? Do you guys remember pop quiz? What is file descriptor zero? Close, file descriptor one, standard out. Close, file descriptor two, standard error. Okay, so my program is now incapable of reading or writing to the keyboard or screen. All right, <clears throat> so I had a little bit of stuff up here. No, actually it doesn't matter. So I do that, and then I would uh, write code to uh, set up a network connection get a file descriptor for the socket. And then I would dupe whatever the file descriptor is twice. Oh, why not? Three times. And so <clears throat> the first time you dupe it, it picks the first available file descriptor, zero. Next time you dupe it, file descriptor one. Next time you dupe it, file descriptor two. Or I could combine those six lines of code into three lines of code by just doing dupe two, the network socket to zero, Network socket to one, network socket to two. <clears throat> and then <clears throat> exec path to Fortran code exec. Pass in null is the parameters. It's always hard to type all twisting in your seat. And that was my entire program.
to your project. <laughs> Did I get a bonus for finishing early? No. In fact, uh, it hurt me financially to finish early. Because they had budget for me for two years. You know, working 20 hours a week, right? Uh, I, at the time, it was probably 20 bucks an hour, I'm tempted to say. 18 bucks an hour, something like that. It was like a PA2, program analyst 2 or 3, something like that. And, uh, <clears throat> yeah, it's like, I'm done. You get paid hourly. Congratulations. <laughs> so, my next step should have been doing this. <clears throat> For two years uh no uh, that was it uh, and so what what this did was it made an old 1970s era fortran program internet enabled right the fortran program thought it was reading and writing to standard input and standard output it wasn't it wasn't it was actually reading and writing to the internet and so um yeah you know, I, I internet enabled a Fortran program like a couple lines ago. That was it. Didn't have to read Fortran. Didn't have to rewrite it in Java or any of this stuff. Just so left it alone. So, <laughs> now it's like, <clears throat> like I was ready to like, when I started, I was like, all right, I'm going to have to learn Fortran. Then I thought about it and I'm like, no, I can do a better way. And then I thought, then I took Bennett Yee's class. And I was like, oh, oh, that's exactly the solution to my problem right there. Deep two, done. I'm just going to close standard in, standard out, standard error, dupe the network socket into it. So the, the Fortran code thinks it's reading and writing standard in, standard out, but it's not. And that's it. That's all I had to do. Uh, the work on the client then took some time because the client, uh, and then there was more to the server that would like send it would do login and stuff like that. You know, you don't want to just expose a program on your server to the randos on the internet, right? And so there's a login process and um, and the uh, server would send configuration data over to the client. I had to write the client, which I wrote in Java. And so the Java client would parse this configuration file and there's a GUI and you could like click on the, I don't know if you guys saw the, the pictures, but. Yeah. So you could like click on these different things here. It would pull off the default value. You can edit it, change it from 50 to 60, you know, and then when you're done, you hit submit and all of those data go into another configuration file, flies back across the interweb to my server. My server strips out all the, you know, headers or whatever, and then puts it into a format that the Fortran program can read. And then does that, what I just showed you right there, feeds the standard input into the Fortran program, standard output of the Fortran program comes out gets shot over to the client and the client that I wrote had to graph the, you know, this kind of stuff. Right? So there, there was more work to be done, but the heart of the matter, which was updating a 1970s era thing to be web enabled. That was the easy part. <laughs> you know, that, that part there, it's just four lines of code. Yeah. You know? A little bit of code to get the sockets going, you know, have some login so you know your standard internet server stuff but the actual heart of it was really easy okay. so the point here is that <clears throat> once you know about system calls then you know what you can do and because I knew, because I knew, yes, that's exactly what I want. Is it not working? You're not working? All right, well, that works. Yeah, let's save that. Okay. So, 
Okay, so system call one, quit your program. System call two, fork your program. System call three, read from a file descriptor. System call four, write to a file descriptor. System call five, open a file. Um, close the file descriptor. Wait for a child process. If you call fork, you can wait for a child process to finish. Uh, create a file. If you want to make a new file, you can create it. Uh, link. Uh, link will actually, you can have two files that are the same file. It's like a, a, a shortcut kind of in Windows. Uh, although they look like real files. Unlink will uh, delete <laughs> a file. Exec turns your program into another program. Uh, change directories, get the current time, uh, create a directory, uh, change the permissions, change owners. Uh, I don't know what that is. I uh, don't know what that is. Uh, change where you are in a file. As you're reading a file, there's a little file uh, offset thing that holds where you are in the file. As you see in, see in, see in, see in, see in. Um, or not really see in, but like if you have a file, ends, 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 ends. There's like a little counter that counts your offset, right? Base is the start of the file. Offset is where you're reading from. And if you want to change where you're reading from, you can seek for forwards or seek backwards in a file using that. Get my current um, process ID number. Uh, mount a file system, unmount a file system. Like if you put a USB drive in, you're probably not going to care about that. Uh, you're probably not even going to have permissions to do that on most systems. Uh, set who I am. Again, you can't do that unless you're root, uh, root access. Get your user ID. Yeah, you can do that. Who cares, though? Um, set the current clock time, which requires root. Um, process tracing. Alarm, uh, which is... Uh, you can make it so that five seconds from now, alarm goes off. So, um, Look, if you're going to run a program and you want to give it a maximum runtime of 10 seconds, you set an alarm for 10 seconds, you run it, and then if the alarm goes off, the alarm is an interrupt, and you have an interrupt handler. Do you guys remember Signal? Do you guys remember this? That, that call? That system call? Does exec run the program? Yeah, it runs the program. That's the loader. That's the loader. So if you, um, So you can actually set up interrupt handlers yourself. The kernel has an interrupt handler. Anytime you do a software interrupt, it invokes the kernel and the kernel has what's called a jump table. The jump table is a giant array of just memory addresses where functions are. They're what we call function pointers in C++. All they are is an int. Almost everything underneath the hood is an int. And so if you want to call a function, like, uh, I don't know, wait three seconds, Wait three seconds is that memory ad memory address 00109D4. And so if you want to have that set as an interrupt, you just take that hex address there and put it into an int and just say, when there is an interrupt of this nature, call this function. So I've got a function here called signal handler. Signal handler is my interrupt handler. And so it's just an int, it's just an int at memory address 0010A30. And so what you do is this. <clears throat> so all a function is is an int. Do so you guys know that? That's all a function is. Underneath the hood, it's just an int. And what is it? When you branch to a function, it just that's an it just gets put into the program counter. That's it. So when you when you call a function, like, I don't know, when you call wait three seconds, that's an assembly move 
into the program counter. So in C++, when you say wait three seconds, in assembly, we would normally do <clears throat> branch with link to wait three seconds. But really, that's all we're doing. We're just putting the address of the function into the perm counter. The perm counter is the re register 15, right? Yeah, and so it just moves the integer and R15, R15 holds the next address to run. And so the CPU says, okay, we're running that thing next. And it jumps there. That's it. If you do branch with link though, <coughs> if you do branch with link, it also does a move into register 14, whatever your current, you know, whatever your current uh, memory address is. So it allows you to come back. Okay. So an interrupt, uh, handler, when you invoke an interrupt, there's something called an, a, a, an, an, a jump table. And basically <clears throat> all a jump table is, is it, it looks, it looks like this. It's just a bunch of functions and their memory addresses. It's actually just the memory addresses. So it's just a big thing like this. And so it says, if sig int comes in, call this function. If sig term comes in, call this function. If sig hop comes in, call this function. What is sig term? What is sig hop? What is sig stop? Glad you asked. Control C, sig int. Notice that, <coughs> notice that vim did not quit. I just hit control C, which normally quits a program and vim did not quit. Instead, vim has a interrupt handler set up that says if the user hits control C, print uh, at the bottom of the screen, type colon QA, exclamation mark. This is in Vim, of course, not regular Vim. Uh, type uh, colon QA exclamation mark, press enter to abandon all changes and exit NeoVim, right? <clears throat> you guys see that? If I hit control S, sig stop, it ignores that as well. Normally, if you're typing things, you hit control S. Look, I'm typing, I'm typing, I'm typing, nothing's happening. Until I hit control Q. Control Q resumes. So you can suspend a process. You can stop, sig stop stops a process from running. And it'll it'll stay suspended until you hit control Q, which is sig resume or whatever. Um, so these are all the different signals that you can send. Sig int, control C. Sig stop over here. Control S. Sig hop. Sig hop gets called if you close putty. It sends a, a hang up. The terminal hanged up. And so that's what gets sent to Vim when you disconnect from putty and Vim writes your file to a .swp file. That's how Vim can do that. It has a interrupt handler set up that if you disconnect from putty while the thing's open, vim main.cc. <coughs> yeah. That just sent a sig hop, hang up. There's a hang up. If I come back in here, go back to door opener dot reference. Uh, you can see that you guys all see the invisible file there. Sig hop, hop, hop. <laughs> you guys all see the invisible file? <coughs> ls dash a there it is no not there interesting did it oh it doesn't save it into the local directory interesting good job neovim puts it in a different directory anyway so when i launch neovim again it's like hey by the way you uh uh you disconnected so do you want it or not and so if i'm like yeah recover it for me bo then it's right there okay if i quit without saving and launch it again it'll still say, hey, you still have that swap file that you haven't dealt with yet. Do you want to deal with it? I'm like, yeah, you know what? That, that swap file is nonsense. Hit D for delete, and the swap file is gone now. It goes back to the previous version. And if I launch it again, there's no more swap file. 
So that is how Vim does that. This is actually a really important thing. Interrupt-based programming is the way of the future. Um, Walker is not here. Um, but Muya, you're in uh, game development right now. How often do you use interrupts in game development? An event handler is an interrupt handler. Yeah. So uh, it's called interrupt-based programming, where uh, your program itself oftentimes does absolutely nothing. But then when interrupts come in, like a keyboard hit, um, or a control C or something like that, then it reacts to it. So it's a very different way of programming. If you do user interfaces, when you when the user clicks on something, you react to it. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah dash A shows all files, and so it'll show invisible files as well. An invisible file is any file that starts with dot, right? So if you go to your home directory, type ls-a, it'll show you all the different hidden files and folders, nano, why do I have a nano directory? Let's get that out of here. Nano, get that out of here. Uh, Wolfram Engine, what is this? Free Civ, Emacs, I mean Emacs is fine. So ls dash all l t r. So this <clears throat> shows all files long. Long listing means it shows permissions and everything. Timestamp, permissions, owners, file name, size. Uh, so that's what the L means. Uh, if you give an H in there, the size, look at the size right now, bridges is like some big thing. If you put an H in there, it makes it human readable. So it becomes 8.1 megabytes. Cool. <coughs> the T means sort by time. Also very useful if you have a big directory, you want to sort it by time. But by default, the newest files are up at the top and you have to scroll up, which is annoying. So you sort it by time reversed. And then the most recent things you changed are down here. Okay. So there's move two, two. Okay. So so signal. Signal sets up an interrupt handler. There's that there's that interrupt handling table of all the different functions you have. There's all the different interrupts that can happen. And then for every interrupt that can happen, there is a function associated with it. And for the what this system call here does <clears throat> is it says when the user hits control C, rather than killing the program, which is the default, that is the default, sigint default, rather than the default signal handler, which kills the program, uh, call my function. And my function up here does this. So that's how you can handle signals. And that's what Vim does if you hit Control S and Control C or whatever. So if you're to run my program, person walks up to a grocery store door, the grocery store door is opening, door is open, person walks through, grocery store door closes behind them, and then the door is closed. So Muya and Muya is up there, and door is opening, and door is open. And then the door is closing. Oh, wait, control C, new person just walked through the door. Door goes back to opening up again. Doors open. Door starts closing again. Oh, no, no, new person just walked in. So as long as people keep walking in through the uh, through the door, the door will stay open, right? So how do you kill your program? Because I'm hitting control C and it's not, <laughs> right? So uh, control backslash is the answer to that. So control control backslash is the way to kill a program. Okay. You want to program a door? Uh, it's probably one of the easier programs you can do. <clears throat> we did that in CSI 40, I think. So that is signal. Um, or that was. Uh, you want to reboot the thing? Here you go. Okay, this is pretty good. Let's put this in here. Yep. 
Yeah, so when you guys go out into the real world, there's a lot of interrupt handling you got to do. Mouse click, right? Keyboard, right? These are all events coming in, but they happen as interrupts. What you do is you have what's called a callback. You have a function, and you say, on mouse click, call this function. And then the user clicks on it, and it calls your function. So rather than main sitting there, going in a loop, is the mouse clicked? Is the mouse clicked? Is the mouse clicked? Is the mouse clicked? Is the, mouse clicked? Is the key? Do they hit the A key? Do they hit the B key? Do they hit the C key? Do da, 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 da. Rather than that mode of programming, what you do is you say, when the user clicks the mouse, call my mouse handler function. And uh, <clears throat> really, Control C. All right, so yeah, so the, the system calls are a list of what you can do. You can reboot the system, right? Reboot the system. Uh, is it not in the list? Great, what a fantastic reference that is. Um, it only has descriptions for the first 30. <laughs> well done, well done. All right. Anyhow, so yeah, you obviously have to have root permission to reboot. But like, this is the list. This is your menu, right? Like, if you guys are chefs, you go into a kitchen, and they're like, "All right, this is what we got. We got ketchup. We got butter. We got a pound of ground uh, turkey. Uh, we got some cloves. We got some chives. We got some basil. We got some olive oil. We got some pasta. You know, they give you a list of everything. That that's that's your formulary. You know." That's your list of things you can work with. So this list of system calls is, at the end of the day, everything you can do on the system. And like most of the stuff, I would say probably requires root or root sometimes, right? So mounting and unmounting file systems. Sometimes it'll allow you to mount or unmount like the CD drive or something like that. But uh, most of the time you can't unmount the file system as a regular user, you have to have root, which is one of the reasons why I, uh, give you guys Raspberry Pis in this class normally so that you can get, you know, experience being root. You know, system pipe. Remember we talked about that? Creating a pipe between different processes and, yeah. So, that's system calls. <clears throat> signal, signal ID to look out for, function to respond with. That's correct. Yeah, so the, uh, so signal is a system call. And you pass in the signal number. There's a, a enum. There's a bunch of constants for for these. There's sig hop and sig ant and all that stuff. And then for the handler, you can either pass in a function. Remember, a function pointer, like in C++, when you have a function pointer, it looks really complicated. The syntax for a function pointer in C++ looks garbage. In assembly, it's actually really easy. It's just a number. It's just an int. You know, like you, like you know, it's just you know, what was it? Signal handler or whatever. You know, whatever. It's you know, it's just like it's just like some number, and so <laughs> it's actually easier probably to do this in assembly. Just what is the address of this function? All right, pass that in. But there's uh, two uh, special things. There's uh, for the thing here, you don't actually have to pass in a function. You can pass in ignore, which tells it to ignore the signal. So if you were to hit control C, nothing happens. And you can also set it to signal default, which puts back on the original behavior. So that if you hit control C, it kills your program. Yeah, so, so there's two special things. And then other than that, you can pass it a function pointer. And yeah. Have you guys ever seen function pointers in C++? Should have function pointer. So a function pointer is just an it, man. That's all it is. <clears throat> it's just an it. And so in the in the uh, Linux uh, in the Linux uh, operating system, it has what's called an interrupt handling table. And what happens? We do SWE zero. All it is just a bunch of events. It's just an array of integers, and each integer is the memory address of a function. And so it's actually very fast. A jump table is um, a very fast way of handling 
um, these interrupts, these SWE zeros, because if you if you put ten into register se seven, uh, yeah, if you put ten into register seven, and you do a SWE zero, then what it does is it has the it knows where it is in memory. The interrupt handler is in memory. It jumps down 28 bytes, or sorry, what did I say, 10? Jumps down 40 bytes, finds the integer there, and puts that into R15. Go. Very fast. Algebra. <laughs> what what system call are we doing? 20? Okay, take 20, multiply by 4, because we're on a 32 bit system. 20 times 4 is 80. The, off the offset is 80. Load the integer from there. Okay, that's the memory address of the function to call. Call it. Put that into register 15 and go very fast you don't have to like search through the entire table uh you just have to um let's see, let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Easy peasy. so i've actually done jump tables before i can show what they look like in the c plus plus set of things um easy peasy is my easy program checker that i made for csi 40 students to find common mistakes that they make. And so we've got here a jump table. Okay. And the syntax of this looks garbage, right? <laughs> Whoa. Whoa. But this is actually, uh, so what, what this is, uh, function pointer syntax in C and C++ looks like garbage. It looks like hot garbage. And in fact, I, I, uh, uh, this was actually a job interview question I was given, not this particular line here. But they had up on a whiteboard <clears throat> a bunch of weird ass looking code. And they're like, what does that mean? And I look at it, and I look at it, and I'm like, is that a function pointer? <clears throat> and they're like, yeah, it is. You want the job? <laughs> You're the first person that actually could recognize that, you know? And so this is this is what it looks like. Okay. So this is a pointer to a function. Remember, a pointer to function is just a memory address. It's just an integer. That's all it is. Like all a function is is just an integer. That's the address that you're gonna jump to. That's it. But C cares about the type of a function. And so it needs to know the name of the function to call it. It needs to know uh, the return type and needs to know the parameter list. And so this is a function pointer and it looks like garbage, right? And so foo is the name of the pointer. It's the name of a pointer. Uh, it's not pointing at anything right now, right? It's, an un, it's a dangling pointer, it's not pointing at anything. But foo is a pointer that is pointing to a function that takes one int and returns void. And that's the syntax for it. So you wrap parentheses around the thing there and put a, a star there. <clears throat> so this is a this is a function pointer named foo that takes a int pointer as a parameter and returns a void pointer as the result. And so what you can do is you can set that pointer, you'd say foo equals the address of a function. Look at that. Do you guys see that? Here's a function named my integer function. It takes an integer as a parameter, returns nothing. I am creating a function pointer named foo. Foo can only point at functions that take ints as parameters and return nothing. And so we're going to set foo equal to the address of this function here. This is how like sort works. Do you guys remember sort? Standard library sort. Sort vec.begin vec.end function pointer, right? Function pointer is um, optional. You would pass in foo. You don't pass in foo parentheses. When you pass in the third parameter to sort, it takes a function pointer. It takes a function pointer to a function that will compare two elements. <clears throat> so if you, uh,
All right, so here's a program that <clears throat> creates a vector of integers, sorts it, outputs it. So much for each. Uh, <clears throat> whatever. Um, yeah, whatever. It doesn't matter. So you see that? It sorts it, right? So do you guys remember the third parameter here? Do you guys remember this? How you can pass in a third parameter? You pass in a function pointer. Okay. So it takes a function pointer to a function that can be named whatever to. It takes in an A and B. Return uh, B is less than A. Notice I'm not calling foo. If I did this, it would call foo. But I'm not calling foo. I am passing foo as a parameter. It's a function pointer. And so this is very common with callbacks. If you want to have a function that gets called every time you click the mouse, you set up a, a, a you basically tell whatever framework you're using, when somebody clicks, call this function. And you pass in a function pointer like this. Okay? And so if I were to do this, then you'll see that it sorts from greatest to smallest. Okay. Because my comparison function that I'm using is returning true if B is smaller than A. By default, it does if A is smaller than B. So if you want to sort it from greatest to smallest, you do something like that. There's actually a standard library function. You stood greater than that does the same thing. So you don't have to you don't have to write it yourself. You don't want to. Okay, so that's a function pointer. Function pointer is just an int, man. Uh, it, the only reason why it looks crazy, like if, if I say I want to have a function pointer to foo, jeez, uh, all right, bool pointer function pointer taking in int a int int there. That makes a variable named function pointer of a type. It can only point at functions that take two instance parameters and return a pool. What do you guys think? Yeah, literally, I, I was at Sony. This is at Sony. I walk in and there's something like that. I don't remember the exact. They're like, what is that doing? And like I said, I'm just looking at it like, the hell is happening here? I thought I knew C++ pretty well. I'm like, is that a function pointer? I'm like, yeah, good job. First person to get that. And I talked, that was the job that I talked myself out of. I, I won the job by knowing a function pointer. I talked myself out of it by um, uh, not showing proper respect, I think. Yeah, that, that was the one where they wanted me to spend all summer programming a robot arm to turn left and to turn right. 
because they wanted to test it was like this robot thing they wanted to you know stress test it and see how long how, how many times you could do this before it broke and I, I asked them like all right well what do you want me to do after i finish it and they're like what do you mean i'm like i don't know it should be like a day or two i mean it's I'm talking like four or five lines of code here like it's not that's not a summer project what, what do you want me to do after I do that? And and they looked at me and they're like, mm, "You're too over, you're you're overqualified for this job." <laughs> I literally talked myself out of working for the place where they made the original PlayStation. You know, the Sony in San Diego was the place where the first PlayStation ones were made, and they were doing all sorts of cool stuff. And I had won the job by knowing a function pointer and talked myself right out of it. So, uh, yeah. But I mean, I was I I wasn't being cocky. I was serious. It's like. Honestly, you know, this like doesn't seem like very much work. <laughs> Still doesn't. And, you know, I was in college at the time. I wasn't even like some like grandmaster hacker or something. I was just like, yeah, this is. I don't know. <laughs> Seems not like very much work. So that's twice now I've financially hurt myself through speed. <laughs> the bioengineering thing. Two years. Yeah, they they they, they you know they were, they were happy. They went way under budget. It was great. Johnson and Johnson, no Pfizer, no, who was it? It was Johnson and Johnson that uh, was funding the grant. He came out, and uh, the guy that was funding it, the the project PI at Johnson and Johnson, I think it was, came out from Ohio to look at my source code, and I I ran him through all the source code. Um, Could be your misremembering. It doesn't matter. Point is, he came out. I ran him through all the source code. This was like at the end of the summer. He's like, how'd you like to work for us? I'm like, yeah, that'd be cool. I mean, I'm still in college, but, you know, like, you know, in a year or so, I'll be done. He's like, cool. You know, what do you feel about working in Ohio? And I was like, yeah, I'll pass. <laughs> He's like, well, if you change your mind, here's my business card. You know, you just saved us a million dollars. I'm like, oh, cool. Did I get some? <laughs> He's like, we've been looking for a technology to do this for a long time. And so we hired UCSD to do it for us. And, and then you did it for them. And so you've saved us a million dollars. You know, it's like, oh, could I at least get the remainder of the balance that was allocated to me? No. Okay. <laughs> so I got a job offer out of it, but that was, that was about it. Fact, Kearney is too overqualified for Sony. Not at all. Not at all. Like I, I had friends working for Sony, and they, they did a lot of cool stuff there. But that particular job was just like an internship position, or something. I mean, it was paid. Like you know, don't ever do an unpaid internship. Is my advice to you guys. But, yeah. Anyway, so that's a function pointer, and so you could do. Um, you can get a job if you know function pointer. Pair. So uh, it, we could do something like this: f pointer is equal to two. And there you go. So function pointer is a variable that can hold memory addresses. <clears throat> F pointer is a function that can hold the memory addresses of functions that take two integers and return a Boolean. Assembly does not care. In assembly, everything's just an int. There is no typing. It's actually easier to do this in assembly because it's just a number, right? You just pull out the, you know. All right, <laughs> store that number. <laughs> Store the number in a variable. That's you know that's what you're going to jump to when there's an interrupt. It's actually easier in assembly because in C plus plus you have this really weird syntax. Right? So, so yeah, f pointer is set to be the address of foo, and then we just pass an f pointer here instead of foo. It does the same thing. It's just an int behind the scenes. It's just an int. So, yeah, I had friends who work for Microsoft too. Um, my lab partner in this class, actually, uh, she went on to um, um, work at Microsoft. Um, her name was Polita Huff, and I was like, whatever happened to her? I looked her up, and there's like a, a, an interview with her. And my friend, another friend of mine who worked at Microsoft, I, I'm like, hey, do you know her? Because you work at Microsoft. Maybe you guys know each other. He's like, yeah, you realize Microsoft is like 
<laughs> a gargantuan multinational company. I don't know. And then he looks at the video. He's like, oh, oh, do you see those awards behind her? I'm like, yeah. He's like, yeah, those are all patents. And he's like, you see those? That means she's like a highly like, like she's like a level 9,000 engineer or something. I'm like, oh, damn. I picked her right when I picked her as a lab partner. You know? um, so, uh, yeah, yeah. So, Microsoft, I've told you guys before, you get levels. So. Print out one. That's interesting. Hmm. Interesting. Just print out one. Huh. Weird. Okay. <clears throat> it's just in it, man. It's just in it. Apparently, it's one. I don't, know. I don't think I've ever printed a function. So, does that make sense to you guys? And so, all a jump table is, it's a table of function pointers. And so, when an interrupt comes in, interrupt 10, it just goes to slot 10 in the array and calls the function there. That's all it does. They do have Bethesda now, that's true. So, if we come back in here, maybe this makes a little bit more sense to you guys now. So this is an array. Look at that. So I have created a function pointer array named bug. These are all the different bugs we're checking for. So I've created a function pointer array named bug. And it's an array of function pointers. And all of these functions in the, fun in the function pointer table take in two different strings. It should be taking them by reference. What the hell? Why is it taking it by value? Ooh, ew, ew. What the hell? By value. Value. I think maybe we did that for a reason, so that the uh, I, I know some of the checks are destructive. Maybe that's why we did that. But yeah, that's a, that's an obvious speed increase we can do right there. To do yeah, make everything const reference. Yeah, very good. <laughs> very, okay. Uh, so all of these functions return a boolean. Is that bug in the thing or not? And it takes in two parameters. It takes in the source code. Uh, and it takes in the source code after it's been uh, sort of tokenized and stripped of strings and comments and stuff like that. And so these are all the different bugs we're checking for. And then uh, the way that easy peasy works is it just says for every bug in the bugs directory, for every bug in the bugs directory, call that function. So this is going to dereference the function pointer. <clears throat> so I goes from zero to you know, whatever the maximum number of bugs is. Uh, so go through every bug in the bugs list and check for that bug, passing in the original source code, passing in the source code with various things stripped out of it. And that's it, and it returns true or false. And if the bug was found, then it prints out the bug. If uh, the bug's not found, then it goes on to the next check. So that's how easy peasy works. It just is an array of functions, uh, of, or an array of function pointers, and it passes your source code to each of the function pointers which is incredibly wasteful because it's making a copy of your source code each time. So <clears throat> that's why it's kind of slow. Probably should be, probably should be fixed. Okay. Do you guys need to see this one more time? What do you guys think? And this, this is what the Linux kernel is doing. When the Linux kernel has a jump table set up like this, when you come in and call interrupt uh, 20, it just goes down to line 20 in the table and calls it. It doesn't have to search or do any crazy processing. Interrupts need to be fast. What do you guys think? All right, so this is a good intro to memory management, All right? So we need to learn about this. Right. So <clears throat> that's what we've been talking about today, the data segment, interrupts, all this kind of stuff. So why does this code crash? Take a look at it. So we're loading into R0, some memory address, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0. And then we try loading from that memory address. Why does this crash? 
those of you that have taken CSI 41 might have an idea. It's not a null pointer. Anyone? Dolio's baking right now. Uh, yes, it is trying to load from too close to zero. Okay. But uh, this code uh, works. Why? This one's even closer to zero. Why does this seg fault? Why does this not seg fault? So what happens is there is a map, there's what's called a memory map. And the memory map determines what chunks of memory your program can read and write to, and which chunks of memory your code can execute. Okay, so by default, only the text segment is marked as executable. You can't run code from the stack because that's how a bunch of hacks used to happen. Um, it would read from the internet, they would put assembly code into the stack they would overflow down into the text segment, change the text segment to say jump into the stack and run that code there. So um, nowadays the text segment is usually marked read only, not writable, and the stack is usually marked non-executable. That's standard security practice now. So what happens is if you try executing code where you're not supposed to execute code, if you try jumping to there in memory like R15, go here, if, you, if that's marked as non-executable, seg fault. If you try reading from memory that's marked as non-readable, seg fault. If you try writing to memory that you can't write to, seg fault. Okay? Seg fault means you do not have access to do the thing you're trying to do. Okay? So there is a piece of your computer called the MMU, which stands for the Marvel Multiverse. Marvel Multiple Universes. The memory management unit. So the memory management unit triggers and interrupt every time um, every time you do well really uh, every time you read read and write from memory the there the it, it sort of invisibly it's a gatekeeper right every try every time you try reading and writing to memory it's sitting there like does he have access does he have access does he have access it has a copy of your memory map does he have access does he have access and um, <clears throat> if it ever says oh no he's trying to read He's trying to write to the kernel. That's not allowed. Then it doesn't interrupt. And the interrupt uh, goes to the jump table that we just talked about in the Linux kernel. The jump table will be like seg fault, sig seg fault, sig, sig, what is it? Sig, sig fault. Seg V, yeah. Sig Seg V, uh, right there. Okay, and so you can actually make it so that if you seg fault, it doesn't kill your program. Cool. Okay, so you can make it so that if your program seg faults, um, you you can handle it. Kind of cool. Kind of cool. So, <clears throat> well, let's say the reason to just say seg fault. When you call the default signal handler for seg fault. It just says segmentation fault core dumped, right? If you make your own, then you can do interesting stuff, right? So for example, let's say there's a seg fault because you ran out of memory, like a heap memory. Then if you have a custom uh, seg fault handler, you'd be like, yo, yo, we're out of memory. And so maybe the, 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 the seg fault handler goes through and frees that memory and then, you know, tries again or something like that, right? <clears throat> so, the only, the only seg fault you can't handle is a stack overflow. If you, have, if you recursively call yourself too many times, you run out of stack space, you can't actually recover from it because to recover from it involves calling a function, this, the signal handler, right? And you don't have any stack space to call the signal handler. And so if you, if you stack overflow, you're dead. It is, it is the one thing you can't recover from. It might work maybe, but it's not guaranteed. So you basically can't handle infinite recursion, which is one of the reasons why 
uh, Microsoft bans recursion as a general principle. They have a middleware system that runs all the Microsoft services on it, uh, services on it. And if it crashes, all of them go down. So if any of these hundreds of Microsoft services do a stack overflow that calls itself too many times, you're doing a binary search tree search and the binary search tree happens to be unbalanced. So it's order n instead of order login. You can easily run out of stack space calling yourself too many times. It takes out Microsoft. All of Microsoft goes down and it has to be rebooted. Which costs money. And well, yeah, everyone's like, why is Innocent not working? Why is Cortana not working? Actually, Cortana, they made their own middleware for it because they didn't want it to be tied to the, the Zen uh, middleware they had for the rest of the company uh, for that reason. And so, yeah, stack overflows are actually pretty, pretty bad. But uh, pretty much any other segmentation violation you can handle. And there's actually really, really cool things that are done with this, by the way. Um, who wants to go down, take down Microsoft? Well, you can't because you don't have you don't have access to their middleware, right? Like you can use it. You're a service. You can use their services, but you can't yeah. um, program it on it. So there's really cool stuff that could be done with this. And can can any of you guys guess what you could do cool with a seg seg fault handler? Trace the seg fault. Yeah, yeah, that's actually a really good one. It's a really good one. Yeah. So you're like, hey, here's where I am. You know, give a better error message, right? So uh, you can have it correct itself. Yeah, you can have it actually not kill your program. If it's anything except for a, a stack overflow, you can resolve it a lot of times. Um, here's a really cool trick that doctors hate. So let's say that you've got a vector that's a gigabyte in size and you copy it. Normally, when you copy a vector, how many operations do you have to do? If the vector is of size n, how many copies do you have to do? n, order n. There's a faster way. Mui is about to say move. No, nope, I'm not talking about moving. Not to, do you guys know about move where one vector steals the internals of another vector? So you can do an order one move. It's like if this guy's going away, then yeah, then this guy would just say, all right, my pointer is pointing at that guy. Then you don't have to copy it. I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about order one copy. We got a gigabyte of RAM here. We got vector A and we want to copy it to vector B. There is a way of doing an order one time. What you do, what you do is you use the cow. Not Devin Nunez's cow. Has anyone heard this term before? Cow? We're in Fresno. You should know cows. <clears throat> move. Yeah, the move instruction. All right, very good. <clears throat> no, you can actually do what's called copy on write. So what you do is you actually mark this. Um, you mark all the pages of memory memory is kind of laid out in pages you mark all of them read only read only read only read only and then when you copy it b is just kind of pointing at a that's it order one we're done because what are the odds you're actually going to change the entire thing not great right maybe you're just going to change a couple of the elements so what happens is that if b tries writing a five in here when there was a zero there before then it does the copy and so this page here because it's marked as read only b tries writing to it seg fault Segfault, because you're trying to write to a read-only chunk of memory. Same thing if A does. If A tries writing to it also, if A tries changing this to one, then you need to duplicate it now. You need to copy only when you write it, right? So when A changes it, now B and A are going to have different things. And so because this thing is marked as read-only, segfault. The segfault handler triggers, what, what, hmm, what's going on here? Oh, you're trying to, you're trying to write to a, a vector that's been duplicated. Oh, let's, let's handle it. And so then it will call new and allocate a chunk of memory and A will be given one because it just wrote a one there and then B had the old value there of zero. And so what it does, it defers the duplication until you actually need the duplication. It's really cool. It's really cool. And this is actually how fork works. When you call fork, 
when you call a fork, it doesn't actually duplicate all the values in RAM. It doesn't. They're actually, two processes actually share the same variables. If you have integer, if you have integer x equals 42, both copies of the program are gonna have the exact same address in memory. And that's fine. As long as it, all they do is read from it, it's fine. But the second that one of them writes to it, if one guy says x is now equal to 40, seg fault, and it splits it into two at that point. And that's really, 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 really fast because the most common thing you do after a fork is what? You just forked into two different programs. What's the most common thing that follows a fork? Exec. Yeah. And so you're not going to need any of that anyway. All of it's going away and we're going to replace all of it with something else. So it'd be incredibly wasteful for fork to actually sit there and copy all of the memory of allocated. It's like, we'll get to it later. And then you exec, you're like, yeah, we're not going to get to that at all. It's like you guys doing homework sometimes. <laughs> I know the homework's due tomorrow, but we got some Valheim to play, so I don't know. <laughs> so Fork's like, yeah, I'll get to it later, and then Exec's like, yeah, we're not doing that. And then it goes away, and you don't have to do the copy. It's really nice. So uh, the um, so cow is actually really powerful. And so you can duplicate a vector in order one time. Isn't that cool? I think it's cool. Don't you guys think it's cool? I think it's cool. I'm going to bully you guys on this one. It's cool. I'm just going to tell you. It's cool. <laughs> You do an order one copy, man. Or it's kind of a deferred copy, you can call it that way. It's like a deferred copy. Because it doesn't actually doesn't actually copy anything. It's like, all right, cool. Yes, it's been copied. And then it just what it does is just writes down like, okay, all right, all right, this chunk of memory here. Read only. All right. Done. <laughs> all right. So so if you actually do end up changing things later, seg fault. Duplicate it, proceed. Okay. So, <clears throat> hard drives, yeah. If you duplicate a file on your hard drive, if it's clever, you'll have what's called a deduplicating. You can have a, a deduplicating file system. And so, if I were to push out a copy of a homework assignment to all of you guys, if the file system was intelligent, it'd be like, yo, that's the same file. I don't need to make 10 copies of it. It's the same file. And then the second that somebody tries saving a copy of it, then it actually makes a new one. You know what I mean? So you got your original, and then DeBello saves a copy, boom, that's when it does the actual copy. And then Shammy comes in, all right, we'll make a copy for him. And then if the two of them uh, you know, are partners and they come out with the same version, then it'll actually merge the two of them together back into one file. So deduplicating file systems are pretty cool. Pretty cool, so same, same principle. <clears throat> It points at the original chunk until it's mutated. Then it does the copy. Yeah. So it, it's a deferred copy. And, and, and the reason why that's fast is because, you know, a lot of the times it doesn't change. You know, like when I push out homework to you guys, you know, the header files that I give you oftentimes will be the same. Like even when you turn them in. Um, the make files. If you don't edit the make file, it will be the same as everyone else's. So just recognize that. You know what I mean? So... Cool stuff. All right, so interrupts are a neat way of being able to handle rareish events without having to constantly pull for them. Right, polling is like saying network card, network card, got any data? Keyboard, got any data? Mouse, got any data? Network card, got any data? Keyboard, got any data? Mouse, got any data? You sit there and you pull over and over. Hey, 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 hey. And you can run your CPU at 100% power consumption that way, you know? Hey, 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 no. Hey, no, hey, no, are we there yet? No, are you there yet? No, all right, eh, eh. With interrupts, what happens is it, the, the, the causality is the other way. And so rather than being like, hey, mouse, do you have any data for me? And said the mouse is like, yo, interrupt. Hey, I, the, the user moved, the user moved. And so um, the mouse will call an interrupt on the operating system. The operating system says, where's my mouse handler at? Jump table, bloop. That's the memory address of the, the mouse handler, bloop. One level of indirection, that's all it takes. Come in, there's gonna be a multiply times four. Interrupt, jump table, comes out, mouse handler is called. And the mouse handler will take in the X and Y location of the mouse now or something like that, right? And then the mouse handler will just probably, I don't know, whatever you have set up, you know, you, if the user clicks, you know, launch a rocket launcher or something like that. 
So you don't have to constantly sit there and say, is the mouse down, is the mouse down, is the mouse down. Instead, when the user clicks, it calls a function that you have specified. It's called a callback. An event handler. Or an interrupt. These are all kind of the same concepts. Function pointer. These are all terms that more or less refer to the same thing. And it's a different way of programming from what you're used to. You know, when you when you write tic-tac-toe as a CSI 40 student, wait until the user types X, you know. You know, in World of Warcraft, if World of Warcraft paused until a person typed a key, it'd be very boring. Instead, World of Warcraft just runs, and then when network data comes in, kind of handles it asynchronously. Uh, every device gets its own interrupt request line called an IRQ. Uh, so the keyboard might be on IRQ 16. Uh, the mouse might be on 20 uh, if you care about this kind of stuff, which uh, nowadays you probably don't really care. Back in the day, you could get what are called IRQ conflicts. Um, then let's see, proc. So this uh, shows you all the different interrupts that are set up on the spurious interrupts. What a great name. And it tells you uh, how often they're happening and stuff like that. So, TLB shoot downs. So cool. So cool. Uh, yeah, and so uh, occasionally multiple devices would share an interrupt request line and that could cause crashes and things like that. Uh, nowadays, the main the main thing is that uh, there's higher priority interrupts and lower priority interrupts. So let's let's say that you're you're handling like your mouse handler, and another interrupt comes in. Who wins? Does the, do you stay in the mouse, or do you switch to the new guy? And so all the interrupts have a priority level, and so higher level priorities will interrupt lower level priorities. But if the lower one comes in, it gets ignored until you're done. Right. So if you try accessing the OS's memory, the OS will seg fault. And then uh, it'll, in general, call the default handler, which just says seg fault and quits. But um, if you've enabled core dumping, then the default, the default uh, uh, seg v, sig seg v handler will dump core. Have you guys seen this before? <clears throat> On limit core dumps whatever dot cc equals memory address zero <laughs> seg fault core dumped. All right. So by default I have core dumping turned off. But um let's turn on debugging with dash g. Hopefully you guys all know that by now. Run it again, segfault core dumped, gdb a.out core. Then you can do a autopsy on the thing. Program died with sig seg v segmentation fault, backtrace. Uh, it tried executing line zero. Uh, ooh, why does it not have the symbols on it? Right, Do you get, did you guys notice that I didn't put in vector angle bracket int? I just said vector. Run segfault gdb a.out core. Really, it's not picking up the symbol information. That's interesting. Huh, weird. Okay, um, yeah, so when you dump a core, then it will give you an autopsy. It'll give you the state of your program at the moment that it died. Will you push your program that adds 10 to the demo section? Yeah, it should be in there. It should be in there already. So CD into ASM demos and uh, you should be able to see it. So what I did here is I made a function that 
is at zero, then it tries executing the code at memory address zero, it seg faults, and it dumps core. And the core files can be useful for debugging what is going on. Okay. okay. So how do we know if something's out of bounds? Well, that's where the MMU comes in. The MMU is a watchdog. That's what stops you from like being able to access Lave's homework and copying it, right? Because Lave is working hard night and day, putting together the most awesome system call, you know, dot CC, whatever, dot S, you know, who cares? Ever. <clears throat> it's in RAM somewhere, right? You should be able to, in theory, be like, hey, pointer, point at that chunk of RAM and read from it. I want to copy Lave's homework so I can get an A2. And um, what happens, though, is that the MMU is like, mm -mm, nope, nope. I know your partner's Vacalar, but you don't actually have access to read uh, the RAM of another user. And so it will go, no, cycle. Okay. So the MMU is the gatekeeper. It, it knows what chunks of RAM you have access to. You can read, write, and execute to. And if you ever do something wrong, seg fault. Okay. So, yeah. Um, it does a lot more of that, though. And so what, one really interesting thing, <clears throat> have you ever thought about this? Uh, your memory address zero is not the same memory address zero of other people. They're all different. So, you know, when you print out like, hey, what's the memory address of variable X? It's like, oh, X is at, you know, seven F, 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 five, A, A, C. <clears throat> That's actually not the address in RAM that it's at. That's the fake memory address. So all of you guys, every time you run a program, it gives you your own memory address. Starting at zero, going up to uh, seven, F, 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 F. All of you guys get what appears to be the entire 32 bits of RAM, right? It, it well, half of it, right? The other half is owned by the operating system. And so when you run a program, it looks like your program starts at zero and goes up to the top of RAM. Guess what? It doesn't. This is all a lie. It is a lie that has been created uh, by the MMU. This is this is the big topic called virtual memory. Virtual memory. You don't actually have access to anyone else's program. When you're in your program, it, it you're in a sandbox. You can only access the RAM in your own program. If you want to talk to another process, use a socket like a civilized individual. <laughs> okay, cake is a lie, All right? So uh, that's where we'll stop for today. <clears throat> so basically, yeah, when you read and write to m some memory address, it's all lying to you. What actually happens is there's some chunk of RAM that it's given you that it's reading and writing to, but your zero is not actually RAM address zero. Your seven F F F F F F F. It's not actually memory address 7FFFFF. There's some mapping that goes on between what you think you have and the actual physical RAM. You can't actually find out where you are in physical RAM. The MMU handles that for you. Okay. Virtual memory. So fun class today, guys. Hope you guys learned a lot. Uh, we talked about interrupts a lot because interrupts are really important. Like not even in this class, just like in general, in professional programming, they're everything. Uh, we talked about system calls, which is the toolbox. That's what you can do. The list of syst calls is the list of things you can do on a system. Make a file, make a directory. Stat it. Stat was one we didn't talk about. Stat gets the permissions on a directory. Like that's that's what you got to work with. You know, it's really important to know what the system calls are because that tells you what you can do. You know, if you ever want to know what you can do, just read the list of system calls. Most of them require root, so you can ignore those. It's not too many. And then we talked about uh, function pointers, interrupt tables, and we're starting to talk about site faults and virtual memory. So have a great spring break, everyone. Uh, work hard on the system call. Homework assignment that'll be due on the Tuesday. We get back after break. Uh, don't party too hard. Or party hard. I don't know. I'm not your mom. <laughs> we're done. All right. Have fun, you guys.